So, uh, welcome to the September meeting of the Mountain Peninsula Astronomical Society. And uh, on the first screen here, you see some of the things that have occurred in the last month, and indeed there have been a lot uh, in the, uh, the world stage. So, we'll start uh, close to home. We uh, had the announcement about a week or so ago that um, the federal government has put uh, $1.18 billion on the table for a project to increase uh, the accuracy of the global positioning system down to um, uh, currently uh, the GPS is accurate to within about 5 to 10 metres so what you have in your phone is only good to that sort of accuracy. It used to be 30 metres um, and this uh, project will bring it down to around the 3 to 5 centimetre accuracy mark. So. Um, uh, I think uh, part of the idea behind this, uh, aside from the obvious um, geoscience uh, applications, will be for driverless cars, because it's good to actually know where in the lane your car is. Uh, 10 metres can be quite a bit of a variation if it starts to uh, wander over the place. Now apparently it, uh, it's ready right now, uh, but you just have to have the right gear to pick it up. Uh, it's meant to go and be fully rolled out by 2028 and you can bet that the public is probably towards the end of that project timeline rather than the beginning of it, but they said uh, within a week or so uh, uh, users can start using it if they actually got the equipment. So uh, the next one was uh, last month, you know, we reported on the three pieces of space junk that came down in uh, the Snowy Mountains area in New South Wales, fourth piece was found, as you can see it's a uh, small bit fell out of the sky. I think that, that bit weighed about 20 kilos, so you certainly know it if it came down on you uh, at the time. And as you see, compared to the size of the dog, it's about the size of uh, a typical dog or maybe uh, half a man. Uh, interestingly, um, even though it lands on the, the farmer's property, it is actually the property of SpaceX and they can come and claim it. But as, as things stand at the moment, they haven't actually exercised um, that uh, to come and get it. So, for example, if um, an aeroplane drops out of the sky and lands on your property, it doesn't belong to you just because it's landed on your property, you'll find that uh, people will come along and take the pieces away and uh, want to do that. So that, uh, that was uh, during the month. The other thing during the month that we'll uh, uh, talk about uh, quite a bit uh, tonight are uh, asteroids. And this one from a couple of years ago uh, was the uh, asteroid uh, Bennu. We'll see in a little while, so let me just uh, show the video of uh, the Osiris Rex spacecraft actually approaching it to land. And uh, it only landed for about six seconds before it fired its thrusters and took off again, taking a sample of uh, the surface uh, when it uh, went down. And uh, they ended up uh, getting quite a bit of a surprise on this one. As you'll see uh, the shadow of the leg of uh, the lander in a moment just uh, coming to view. Very, very briefly, just before it touches the surface. You can see there's quite a lot of rock. There's the, uh, the shadow of the leg, samples, and then blasts off after uh, six seconds. Uh, what they uh, now realise is that um, this asteroid is not solid. It's like a, uh, um, a, a conglomerate of, uh, of boulders and um, pebbles and, and small stones that's just basically held together by a gravity. So uh, that uh, has pluses and minuses. Um, if you're trying to fly a spacecraft and do it to uh, change its orbit, uh, you don't want that. You want something solid that uh, if you give it a whack, it passes that whack on to the uh, asteroid very, very efficiently. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, NASA refers to it as the surface has uh, impact armor because, because it's all sort of light and uh, easily moved around, effectively like someone dumping a lot of gravel on it. Uh, you, you hit something into it, it's not going to pass the energy, it's going to absorb the energy like your crumple zone on your car. So if you remember the old cars when they were really solid back in the 1950s and earlier, when the two of them hit together, people got really injured because a lot of energy was involved in the collision. But cars these days have built-in designed uh, crumple zones so that a lot of the energy, the impact is actually taken by a uh, bending metal. So uh, they were quite surprised by this one. So it would be very interesting to see this one that uh, is coming up on Tuesday as to how uh, solid that one is and how well that uh, reacts. Now the other thing um, uh, in the astronomical world at least was uh, the passing of uh, Frank Drake, who's uh, known for the Drake equation. And we'll see some of that a little bit later on uh, tonight. Um, he was uh, 
involved for most of his career in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, worked a lot with uh, Carl Sagan, and you might recognise these uh, things over here on uh, the uh, right hand side, where both he and uh, Carl Sagan actually collaborated on them. The earliest one here was the famous uh, plaque on the side of uh, Pioneer, Pioneer uh, 1 and 2, and um, uh, when, they, uh, they, when they went out towards the solar system, that plaque will be there until it's obliterated by micrometeoroids, so it may, may last a billion years or so before that uh, actually occurs in uh, interstellar space. He also worked on the later golden records of uh, a Voyager, whereby they transferred the sounds of the songs of Earth uh, onto it using good old vinyl technology, uh, which is interesting that uh, if we came across one of these floating in space and tried to play it ourselves these days, it would probably be quite an exercise to find something that could actually play uh, a record uh, like that at all. And the other one was the famous Arecibo message where the giant Arecibo telescope that no longer exists after it uh, collapsed um, about a year or two ago, uh, they transmitted this message uh, looking very much like a 1980s uh, Pokemon sort of uh, image, uh, transmitted that uh, from the Arecibo telescope and that's uh, well and truly on its way, I can't remember which star system it was aimed at, but uh, it's uh, on its way broadcasting our uh, our existence uh, to aliens. You can see a bit of a DNA spiral there and there's uh, the Arecibo telescope as it existed at, uh, at that time and various things like that. And we'll, we'll come to some of these a little bit uh, later. Now interestingly NASA said the, uh, with the back to Bennu, um, the, uh, the closest uh, analogy they actually had to it was it's just like a, a ball pit at a, at a kid's uh, amusement park. So um, they, they actually said that uh, if they'd left it much longer than the six seconds before they fired the thruster, that the thing would have started to actually sink into the, uh, at the asteroid itself. And uh, that would have made some uh, very interesting live television, I would have thought. Okay, so tonight we'll go through um, the uh, events of the past month and uh, coming up uh, very, very quickly. Then uh, we'll spend about 10 minutes uh, on this uh, update, which is only a few days old, on the, the, uh, the DART uh, mission, which is going to impact on Tuesday morning our time. Uh, so this one's from Oxford University. Then we'll go into the main one on the, uh, the science of Star Trek. And uh, this was a public lecture that was given, oh, I think, about uh, 12 weeks ago, so it's uh, fairly recent. Um, and so there are some parts of Star Trek there that even I've not seen, so there must be uh, more recent episodes than, uh, than are commonly uh, available to our public. Um, then on to Sky for the month uh, with Mark. And then we'll break for um, uh, tea break around there, and then uh, the, the last half hour or so. We'll uh, show some more on the DART mission. I'll show this one from a couple of years ago. This is one of the original project scientists, Nancy Shabu, talking about the mission, why they're doing it. Some of the dates are slightly wrong. So, for example, she'll mention that it's due to land on the 30th of September. Uh, due to impact 30th of September, things have obviously come forward a little bit since then. Um, and this is uh, a few weeks old here. These are the um, uh, specific videos given by people uh, actually on the project that built the, uh, the DART um, uh, spacecraft. Uh, each of them giving like uh, two or three minutes on uh, why they did it and uh, why it was so important to them. So uh, that's actually quite interesting. Then we'll finish off explaining with the uh, Drake equation and uh, also the current uh, state of uh, SETI, at least uh, current while uh, Frank Drake was uh, still with us. And then we'll uh, close at the end um, with uh, some more uh, impacts. I'll leave that for a little bit later. So recent events, we had uh, quite a lot uh, shown down there. Lots and lots of cubs, lots and lots of scouts, lots and lots of cloud. Uh, but there have been one or two ones there where uh, fortunately no clouds were around when we had a lot of scouts uh, turn up uh, at uh, that event. We were, it was about twice as many as we were expecting. Um, somewhere around uh, August, September, we had Simon start to give away uh, telescopes. Um, over, the, uh, over a period of uh, weeks and that proved very, very successful and uh, lots of uh, appreciative uh, members there. Uh, if it had been any other society, I suspect they would have either uh, raffled them off or, uh, or tried to sell them to uh, members instead. So uh, we, uh, we approach things quite uh, differently here. So lots and lots of things actually occurred. Down the bottom of the last one was the astrophotography workshop and there are all the uh, speakers 
showing down there. Many of whom are uh, in the room here uh, tonight. And there's a photo from the astronomical, uh, the astrophotography uh, workshop. This one was taken by uh, Jane Pohl, showing uh, Nerida at the back there. And uh, this one over here is uh, Alison Walsh's son, Joshua Walsh. He's uh, 11 year old. This is the donated telescope that uh, he uh, was given by uh, the society. And um, although he's uh, 11 years old, he's doing year 11 physics at the moment, just about finished year 11 physics. So um, he may not be year 11 in all uh, areas, but uh, certainly in the sciences, he's uh, very, very confident. Uh, amazingly so for that age. He took that telescope out. It's the first time he's ever looked at a telescope or even binoculars. And uh, he took it out that evening onto the road, turned it onto the moon and took a picture uh, with eye priest projection on his iPad. And that's uh, entirely um, on his own, unassisted. So um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he uh, hopped online and had a look at uh, YouTube maybe along the way. Uh, just because uh, uh, I spent some time explaining to him about an equatorial mount and uh, how to show uh, that, that sort of thing and how to handle it. Uh, but uh, amazing, amazing effort for his first time of any sort of photography. Now coming soon, we've got uh, the uh, obviously the dark collision on uh, Tuesday. Um, committee meeting will be by uh, Zoom next uh, Wednesday. The next cosmology interest group is confirmed for Saturday, the 1st of uh, October. Um, and then followed later on that day, so that starts here at the Brass at 2 o'clock. And then at 6 o'clock, we've got the public night that will be at the base of Oliver's Hill in uh, Frankston, whereby uh, anyone from the public can come, and, uh, come along and have a look at the moon. Um, Nerida officially signed us up for uh, the, uh, the NASA event, so we've got all the um, official certificates and everything to uh, give away to anyone who uh, wishes to put their name down uh, for that. Now, Daylight Savings is uh, coming imminently, and then the very next day we're off to Alex Cherney's um, primary school in Beau Morris, and um, that will be at seven o'clock. That's the first time we've been to that uh, primary school, and uh, we definitely need some helpers to come along to that, particularly up the uh, Morris Way, and uh, have a uh, have a good show there. And uh, his uh, his niece, I believe, is one of the Ukrainian uh, refugees that um, has uh, been given like a three-year visa uh, to uh, visit, and she'll be there that night as well. So we'll try and put on a uh, good show for them. A couple of days later, this, this is going to be quite a busy week as well. We've got Turek College again here at uh, the Briars. And at this stage, uh, I'm not sure who's talking on that one. And then uh, public night uh, with uh, Manfred that uh, Friday. So um, uh, we we're, uh, we're anticipating it to be uh, full to our sort of, uh, sort of COVID capacity of uh, 70. Um, then uh, coming up uh, in middle of October, Brian Cox, uh, that event is uh, coming up for those members that bought tickets uh, way back uh, when, uh, when the dates had to be changed due to lockdowns and then the next uh, monthly meeting on the 19th of October. Now on to DART, the uh, double asteroid uh, redirection uh, test. Uh, this is showing the planets here as they were a couple of days ago. And you see the sun in the middle there, and there's Mercury, there's Venus, there's that asteroid Bennu, the one that's uh, like a little uh, ball pit. And uh, that's the Osiris Rex spacecraft that actually landed on it, so you see it's uh, um, a little bit further away. You'll notice its orbit indeed crosses Earth's orbit, so that, that's why NASA's interested in these things. Over here is the um, asteroid that uh, the DART spacecraft is uh, heading for, uh, Didymus, and um, it's, uh, it's little moon dimorphous, it's going to impact into the little moon and you can see its orbit is way out here, outside of the orbit of Mars and it then comes in here and, and sort of crosses Earth's orbit as well and hence why it's uh, you know, important to know where these things are occurring. Now you'll notice here that if the Earth is here and the Sun's there, that means because this is occurring in daytime our time, 9.14, that means we're on the side of the Earth that's facing the Sun and hence we're not going to be able to see this part of the sky anyway in that direction so you're not going to be able to observe it yourself with uh, instruments of the daytime. If you're on the other side of the earth from us then uh, in theory you could actually pick it up. Um, uh, I'm not sure how what the magnitude is of, um, of both of those uh, objects. That I imagine they'd be quite low but uh, maybe within reach of a, uh, a decent uh, amateur telescope. 
And uh, you'll notice how, how, how the spacecraft actually doesn't head straight for the asteroid. It, uh, they calculated it very carefully that um, they'll, they'll rendezvous uh, also while the thing is moving away from the Earth at the same time as well. So what if they made a bit of a mistake and uh, they hit the wrong thing and maybe um, uh, were more effective than planned, uh, they, they wouldn't accidentally knock it towards Earth. Now they don't actually know that it looks like that, but uh, NASA has actually assumed that the asteroid looks something like that, and that's the relative sizes of the two. So Digimus is the big one, and uh, Dimorphus is the small one. Uh, the moonlet is, uh, is about 160 metres in diameter, so it's a, it's a decent sized rock, um, but they've rendered that based on a generic sort of looking asteroid. It's not as if they've sent a spacecraft there before. Now this goes for about 10 minutes. This is from uh, Kane, uh, Oxford University. And uh, because it's in the UK, they'll refer to UK time of the impact being Monday. Um, that's why I've written on the top there. It is actually Tuesday, Tuesday morning our time. On Monday, the 26th of September, 2022, NASA's DART mission will end its 10 month journey and crash into the asteroid Dimorphos. Now, the whole idea with the DART mission is to test whether we could potentially change the course of an asteroid that was potentially hazardous to Earth. Now, thankfully, there is no asteroids that we know of that are a current or a future threat to the Earth. But if we ever did find ourselves in that situation, we'd want to be prepared so that we don't have this mad dash scramble to try and save the planet in a deep impact style situation on our hands. However, did not destroy the comet. There are now two pieces, one six miles wide, the other a mile and a half. Now, despite what every Hollywood disaster movie would have you believe, you don't need to blow up an asteroid to no longer make it a threat to Earth. All you have to do is nudge it off course slightly, essentially crash a spacecraft into it that will act a little bit like a cue ball in a game of pool or snooker, transferring all of the energy from the spacecraft to the asteroid, usually that are traveling in opposite directions as well. So on like a cue ball, essentially, you cancel out some of the asteroid's motion, slowing it down slightly so that as the asteroid is moving, and the Earth is moving, the asteroid gets there just that little bit later and just misses the Earth. So since this impact with Dimorphos is imminent now, here are three things that you need to know about the DART mission. Number one, the asteroid chosen for this mission is not a danger to us and it won't be after the spacecraft impacts either. And the asteroid Dimorphos was specifically chosen for the DART mission because it's not just a lone asteroid. In fact, it's an asteroid moon. It is in orbit around a much larger asteroid known as Didymus. So when the DART spacecraft crashes into Dimorphos, cancelling out just that little bit of energy of Dimorphos, it'll only affect its orbit around Didymus and not send it closer to Earth or put it on a collision course with Earth either. That's also true for the much larger asteroid Didymus, which is currently in orbit around the Sun. Just taking away that little bit of energy from Dimorphos doesn't change the orbit of Didymus. And we know that even though that Didymus is classed as a potentially hazardous asteroid, just because of its proximity to Earth in the orbit it takes around the Sun, we know that it's not going to be on a collision course with Earth for at least the next 100 years and beyond. And it won't be after the DART mission has collided with Dimorphos. The second thing you should know is how we'll know that it worked. Now, DART is set to crash into Dimorphos at 6.6 .6 kilometers a second in the opposite direction that Dimorphos is orbiting Didymus. And so it will cancel out some of its energy and slow it down slightly. Now, what that means is that Dimorphos' orbit will change. It'll actually get closer to Didymus and it won't take as long to do one loop around Didymus. Now, right now, it takes Dimorphos 11.9 hours to do one orbit. And we reckon that should change, you know, estimating sort of, you know, the mass of the DART spacecraft and the mass of Dimorphos that we've estimated as well. That should change to 11.8 hours after the impact. That's only a change of about 4.2 minutes in the orbit time, but even just that tiny change would be enough in the energy of an asteroid for something that would ever be potentially hazardous to Earth. Remembering that the Earth moves its entire diameter in its orbit every seven minutes. 
Now, the launch of the DART mission with times that arrived and impacted with Dimorphos when the Didymus system was closest to Earth that it ever comes. That means that telescopes on the ground that will be observing the system before and after will have a much easier time of detecting both of the asteroids, because if they're closer to us, they'll be larger in the sky and therefore reflect more sunlight and be much brighter. There'll be loads of telescopes on the ground that will monitor both the separation of Didymus and Dimorphos and the time it takes Dimorphos to loop around and complete one orbit before and after the impact. Any changes we see in that orbit time or the separation of Didymus and Dimorphos are going to be key in allowing us to calculate how much energy was actually transferred from the DART spacecraft to Dimorphos and whether it was the same as we predicted to give us a roughly you know, 4.2 minute change in that orbit time. Knowing that is going to be crucial to the success of this mission, because essentially what we need to know is how much energy can a spacecraft like DART impart to an asteroid, and then is that scalable for asteroids of all different sizes, or will this method only work up until a certain mass or size of asteroid? As well as all of these ground observations, there's also a tiny cube satellite developed by the Italian Space Agency that will separate from DART 10 days before impact, and then it will record images of the actual impact itself, plus the resulting ejector that will get thrown out from the crater that's left behind as well, so we have a better idea of how the impact actually occurred and how it affected the asteroid. There's also a European Space Agency mission called HERA set to launch in 2024 and head back to Didymus to investigate the aftermath in more detail. Because it could be that the impact throws up a load of dust from the surface of Dimorphos, dust that then blocks light, i.e. blocks sunlight from getting to the surface of the asteroid and reflecting off it so that we can detect it with our telescopes. It would make the asteroids much fainter to us here on Earth so that we couldn't perhaps actually see the position of Dimorphos very well or with great accuracy and therefore couldn't determine the separation or even the orbit time of Dimorphos with very good accuracy either. If that's the case, then sending obviously Hera back to investigate this system in a couple of years time is going to be crucial for actually determining what impact we have with this actual impact over the DART spacecraft. And finally, if this works, how quickly could we get a mission like this off the ground if we found an asteroid that was a danger to us? Now, if we ever did spot an asteroid or a comet that was a threat to Earth, we don't really know how much time we'd have sort of in warning to prepare something, because it all depends on the mass or the size of the asteroid and also the angle of travel compared to the angle that the Earth is traveling at around the Sun. So a much bigger asteroid, for example, would be much brighter in the sky. It would be much more obvious. We'd have a much better chance of spotting it and knowing what orbit it has and predicting if in, you know, X number of years, or that's, you know, 100 years time or so, whether in that time period it would ever be a threat to Earth. And we could have decades of warning. But if you have something like a comet, which are much rarer because they come from the very far reaches of the solar system, but on very direct orbits at steep angles to Earth. So you don't start to spot those until they get much closer, so you'd have less time. So you could have a scenario where you'd have decades of warning, or you could have a scenario where you only have a few months of warning, like in the recent film, Don't Look Up. So having a project like the DART mission, which is tried and tested that we hopefully know works, we should know that soon, you know, that we can literally just unbox and launch is a great idea. But still, you will have some time constraints on how quickly you can do that. So we can look at the development of the DART mission as an idea for how long it would take to relaunch something like this. So of course it was decades of planning and design and redesign for the DART mission, but we can assume obviously that's all been done now. So let's just focus on sort of the um, building and then testing of the DART mission before it launched. So the DART mission passed its final critical design review in November of 2019, meaning that it could move to its fabrication and assembly stages where it was actually being built. And then by May 2020, it was finally ready after, you know, a couple of delays due to the COVID-19 pandemic to move from assembly into its final sort of testing and install stages. 
That stage took over a year or so with the spacecraft finally ready for launch by October 2021. It was eventually launched in the launch window of November 2021. So let's say on the first go with the DART mission, it took six months for all the fabrication and assembly, which was pretty quick because this is a fairly simple spacecraft. All you need it to do is slam into the asteroid, essentially, which means it's also pretty cheap as well. And then you've got 15 months for all of the integration and testing that's done on it. Now, obviously, that's the first time that we've ever done that. So everything's going to be slower because you're sort of problem solving as you go as well. But then obviously, the stuff was delayed and made more difficult by the pandemic as well. So I imagine those timescales could be shortened if we were ever to try and, you know, do this again by literally throwing more money at it and more people at it. So let's guesstimate, let's be conservative and say we could maybe half those timescales. So three months for the assembly and, and then say like seven months or so, seven and a half months for the integration and the testing that means that it's ready for launch. So that quick back of the envelope calculation suggests that we could have a clone of the DART mission ready to go in just under a year or so after the discovery of a potentially hazardous asteroid. That could probably reduce even further if, you know, we decide to fund uh, the manufacture of a clone DART mission that would be, you know, in the box and ready to go in case of emergencies. And perhaps we would do that if the DART mission is successful when it crashes into Dimorphos very soon. So I don't know about anybody else, but the fact that the DART mission is close to impact with Dimorphos on Monday the 26th of September 2022, and that we'll finally be able to test if this method of planetary defense actually works, really helps me sleep better at night. Now, you can watch the live coverage of the impact from NASA's ground control on NASA's social media platforms. I'll pop a link in the video description down below to NASA TV's YouTube channel where you can watch it. The coverage from NASA will start at 6 p.m. Eastern US time on that Monday with the impact schedule for 7.14 p.m. Eastern US time. So the link uh, for that I sent around a couple of days ago on the Scorpius is an email and uh, they'll begin the transmission about uh, what, eight o'clock in the morning our time. And with that, we'll uh, head into the uh, the science of uh, Star Trek by uh, Dr. Michael Wong from uh, the uh, Carnegie Institution. And uh, this was a, uh, a talk that was given uh, a couple of months ago. So uh, welcome everyone uh, to the science of Star Trek. Before we begin, I want to issue a spoiler warning because in this event, we are going to be spoiling various plot points from the entire Star Trek universe, from the original series in the 1960s, all the way through to the modern streaming shows like Discovery, Picard, and Strange New Worlds. And there's really no way to talk about the science of Star Trek without talking about Star Trek. So if you are extremely spoiler averse, this may not be the event for you. But that said, I hope that you all stick with us throughout this entire event because we are going to visit some incredible places and learn some amazing things. And I hope that this discussion will deepen your appreciation for the Star Trek that you may have already seen and make you more eager to go and watch the Star Trek that you have not visited yet. And so with that, let's begin. So I always like to begin these uh, lectures with something called Faraday's Law of Induction. So you may be familiar with Faraday's Law. You may even remember playing around with it in science class. Generally, it's demonstrated with a coil of wire and a magnet. And what you do is you pass the magnet through the wire and the changing magnetic fields induces an electric current in the wire. Now, when this was discovered, it helped us unify the forces of electricity and magnetism into something that we now know and love as electromagnetism. Now imagine, imagine, that you could somehow unite the forces of electromagnetism with the force of gravity. And as Einstein told us, gravity is nothing more than the bending and rippling of space-time. So what if you had an electromagnetic energy source so powerful that you could literally warp the space around you, expand it behind you, contract it in front of you through the power of science? plus a little sprinkling of imagination. 
you will have created a tidal wave of space-time that you could surf faster than the speed of light. What would you do with such a marvelous engine? I think I know. I think you'd venture out into space, the final frontier. Explore strange new worlds. Seek out new life and new civilizations. Boldly <laughs> find yourself under a pile of troubles. You'd be an explorer going where no one has gone before. And all the while making new friends, sharing fond memories, and learning what it means to be human. This was the vision of a man named Gene Roddenberry, who in 1964 wrote a proposal to NBC Studios for the creation of a brand new science fiction show that he called Star Trek. Now, ever since Star Trek's inception, Gene Roddenberry knew that he wanted science to be at its core. So much so that he wrote in this 1964 proposal about an equation penned just a few years earlier by astrophysicist Frank Drake. This is what Drake's equation looks like. It's meant to help us organize our knowledge and our ignorance about the cosmos in an attempt to estimate the number of intelligent transmitting civilizations in the galaxy. The thing is, back in 1964, you couldn't just Google Drake's equation. In fact, Gene Roddenberry had no idea what Drake's equation even looked like. So under the pressure of the studio to submit his proposal on time, he simply scribbled something random onto a piece of paper and sent it in. <laughs> now, luckily, the studio also had no idea what Drake's equation looked like, and Star Trek was approved. Legend has it that many years later, Professor Drake was actually invited aboard Star Trek to scientifically advise an episode of Star Trek Voyager. And when he was on the set, he was shown this fake Drake equation that Gene Roddenberry had penned in his name. And when he saw it, he just laughed. He said, oh, Gene, didn't you know that raising something to the first power is simply itself? Like, why would you write that? <laughs> So here's what Drake's equation actually says. Uh, again, it's trying to estimate the number of intelligent transmitting civilizations in the galaxy. So unfortunately tonight, we don't have time to go through each and every one of these terms in great detail, but suffice it to say that the last four terms, those shown here in red, are really difficult to estimate. They deal with things like the probability of the emergence of life or the lifetime of a transmitting civilization. These are numbers that we have no idea what they are to this day. But the first three numbers, those shown here in blue, are astrophysical quantities. These are numbers that we can try to get a handle on through astronomical observations today. So if we take just those first three numbers and we multiply them out, we'd get the number of Earth-like planets in the galaxy. That's the number of stars in the galaxy multiplied by the fraction of those stars that are planets multiplied by the number of Earth-like planets per planetary system. Now, Gene Roddenberry still had no idea what this number was. In the 60s, there was just no way for him to know. But he did know that whatever this number turned out to be, it was going to be huge, right? Because the number of stars in our galaxy is literally astronomical. So when you discover what this number is tonight, you are going to have a choice to make. You're going to have a choice about how you're going to feel about this number. Are you going to feel small? Because you're just one insignificant being on a tiny mote of dust floating in a vast cosmic void? Or are you going to feel large because you're connected to this grand evolving universe of ours and special because despite what might be out there, despite all of those possibilities, there's still just one and only one of you. 
This is the kind of mathematical philosophizing that Dr. Leonard McCoy brought to his captain, Captain James T. Kirk, in an episode of classic Star Trek called The Balance of Terror. In this episode, Captain Kirk is pitted against an equally formidable Romulan captain. And he's feeling the draining weight of Starship Command. He's second-guessing his every move. He just wants a vacation. So Dr. McCoy comes to his captain to spur him back into action. And he does so by prescribing a very peculiar, though very potent, medicine. And that is the mathematical probabilities of the universe. In this episode, Dr. McCoy says to Captain Kirk, in this galaxy, there's a mathematical probability of three million Earth-type planets. And in all of the universe, three million million galaxies like this. And in all of that, and perhaps more, only one of each of us. Don't destroy the one named Kirk. It's a very powerful scene from the TOS episode, Balance of Terror, in which Dr. McCoy claims that there are three million Earth-type planets in our galaxy. Well, let's see how right he was. Today, we know that there are some 200 billion stars in the Milky Way. Now, this isn't an exact number. It's just an order of magnitude estimate, but it'll suffice for our purposes tonight. Thanks to the Kepler Space Telescope, humankind's greatest planet-finding machine to date, and the TESS Telescope, which will soon surpass Kepler's planet-finding record, we now know that the fraction of stars that have planets is essentially one. And thanks to the hard work of astrophysicists around the globe, we now know that roughly one in five of those stars has an Earth-sized planet orbiting in that star's Goldilocks zone. So if you multiply these three numbers together, you get something like 40 billion. 40 billion. And remember, a billion's a thousand times more than a million. So Dr. McCoy was off in his estimate by a factor of over 10,000. Yikes! But it's okay. We'll forgive Bones. After all, he'd love to remind us, damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not an astrophysicist. <laughs> so... One criticism you might make of the Drake Equation framework is its requirement for Earth-like planets. It's quite possible that we need to cast a wider net in order to truly appreciate the diversity of life in the universe. In fact, I have colleagues who would argue you'd learn very little about what life actually is unless you found it in a truly exotic environment. One maybe like Jupiter, Okay, this is Jupiter. Jupiter is a gas giant planet. It's got no solid surface, no oceans of liquid water. This is not the first place you'd think of for looking for life elsewhere. But the idea of life floating in gaseous atmospheres has been around for many decades. Carl Sagan and Ed Saltpeter published a seminal paper in 1976 speculating about an ecology of what they called floaters and sinkers in Jupiter's atmosphere. And just this year, in the fourth season of Star Trek Discovery, we went where no one has gone before, journeyed beyond the edge of the Milky Way, and were introduced to species 10C. These creatures inhabit gas giant atmospheres beyond the shores of our galaxy and communicate via a combination of chemical pheromones and light pulses. As an astrobiologist, I get so excited by this. I love pondering this kind of alien ecosystem. And one of the first questions that I ask is this aerial biosphere that the 10 C are a part of, that they evolved in, that they thrive in, where would it get its energy from? Well, unfortunately, I've never had the pleasure of con conversing with a member of Species 10C, but I do know how I am powered. I eat and I breathe, and in my mitochondria, electrons are shuttled from the food that I eat to the oxygen in the air that I breathe. And it's this transfer of electrons that powers me to do cool things, like be with all of you tonight and talk about the science of Star Trek. Now, if the transfer of electrons to power something sounds a little bit odd, I promise you it's not. It's exactly what happens when you light a piece of wood on fire or flip a switch to light a room. And so in general, what life does is that it transfers electrons from some reductant or electron source to some oxidant or electron sink. 
And at the planetary scale, one could say that what life does is it completes a geochemical circuit. At the very beginning of life on Earth, the two ends of this geochemical battery may have been hydrogen and methane as the electron source, and CO2 and nitrogen oxides as the oxidant. We would call this kind of life chemotrophic life or chemical eating life. Now, on the early Earth, one end of this geochemical battery would have been much more abundant. There was plenty of CO2 available in Earth's early atmosphere. So life would have had to huddle around geological sources of hydrogen and methane until it discovered a very clever trick. And that is to make its very own electron source by splitting apart water using sunlight, breaking apart an H2O molecule, resulting in hydrogen that it can use in its metabolism, and just discarding that oxygen because back then it was useless. This is a process that we call oxygenic phototrophy. Now, the situation would be reversed on a gas giant planet because there, hydrogen is everywhere. It's literally 90% of the atmosphere. You have more reductant, more electron source than you know what to do with. What life needs is to make a good oxidant. So I hypothesize that life in such an atmosphere would be incentivized to evolve a way to split water using sunlight in exactly the same way as it does here on Earth. But instead of coveting that hydrogen, coveting the oxygen that it makes through this process instead and just spitting the hydrogen back into the atmosphere because who needs that on a gas giant planet? In my mind, this hydrogenic phototrophy would be the basis of an ecosystem such as the 10 seas or an ecosystem on any hydrogen dominated world. So our takeaway from thinking about the 10 C just a little bit deeper is that life is flux. Life runs on a flux of electrons, which necessitates a flux of gases. And what specific gases those are depend on the specifics of the environment in question. On Earth, it's one thing. On a gas giant, it needs to be something else. And this is the first of our major takeaways tonight. Okay, so despite the 10 C's massive ecological differences from us, Biochemically, they're actually quite similar. There's this beautiful Star Trek moment where a team of scientists, medical doctors, diplomats, and linguists work together to decipher the 10 C's chemical language. And they found out that the 10 C communicate via hydrocarbon pheromones, just like many animals on Earth do. In fact, these pheromones even had an effect on the human members of the Discovery crew. So in the grand scheme of things, the 10 C are basically just like us, carbon-based bags of mostly water. But what if there's life out there that has a completely different biochemistry from our own? Well, Star Trek has explored situations just like this in the classic Star Trek episode called The Devil in the Dark. Kirk and crew encounter the Horta, a monster that was terrorizing a colony of miners. But turned out just to be a mother trying to protect her young. This creature eluded Starfleet sensors because, as Mr. Spock explains, life as we know it is universally based on some combination of carbon compounds. But what if life exists based on another element? For instance, silicon. To which Dr. McCoy proclaims, you're creating fantasies, Mr. Spock. Well, it turns out that Spock was right in this case, as he often is. The Horda turned out to be a silicon-based life form. Still, I think that Dr. McCoy's skepticism was justified in this case. And let me explain a little bit more about why. So people often consider silicon to be a good alternative to carbon because it has similar chemical properties. For instance, it has four valence electrons. That just means that it can make four bonds with other atoms. So for instance, here you see methane, CH4, and on, on the other side of the slide, you have silane, SiH4. They have very similar tetrahedral structures. But if we scratch just a little bit deeper at the chemistry, 
we start to run into some major problems. You see, chemical bonds are often not equal sharing endeavors. Uh, in the methane molecule, this carbon tugs on the electrons in those bonds a little bit harder than the hydrogen does, meaning the electrons in this molecule spend most of their time huddled around that central carbon atom. But in the case of a silicon hydrogen bond, the polarity of this bond is reversed. These, uh, these electrons in silane are actually going to spend most of their time on the outskirts of the molecule, making silane highly reactive. In fact, it's so reactive that it spontaneously combusts which is probably why you've never heard of it before. You, you would never have gone into a place on this world where silane was a stable molecule. So, you know, what's the first thing that engineers in Star Trek try to do when they're faced with any problem imaginable? Well, they try to reverse the polarity, right? And this is a real life example of how reversing the polarity is so crucial. It's literally the difference between a stable molecule like methane and one that spontaneously combusts like silane. Now, life also needs to constantly replenish itself with new materials, and life on Earth primarily gets its carbon from carbon dioxide, which is a gas that wafts around everywhere, is universally accessible. Now, here's CO2, carbon dioxide, and SiO2 on the face of it. They look just the same. But again, if we dig just a little bit deeper, we run into some major problems. CO2, like I said, doesn't like to react with things. But SiO2 has a propensity to react with itself, making these complex matrices. In fact, SiO2 has a more colloquial name that you may be familiar with. It's quartz. So basically, unlike carbon, silicon is pretty difficult to access by biology. Now, let me be clear. I am not saying that Star Trek was wrong for depicting the Horda as a silicon-based life form. What I'm actually trying to say is that Star Trek got it right by continuing the dialogue between Dr. McCoy and Spock like this. McCoy says, Silicon-based life is physiologically impossible, especially in an oxygen atmosphere, and he's 100% right. To which Spock replies, it may be, Doctor, that the creature can exist for brief periods in such an atmosphere before returning to its own environment. And that is exactly what we saw in The Devil in the Dark. So our lesson from the Horta is that our chemistry may not be universal or fundamental to life, because the Horta is an amazing science fiction example of how we need to be open-minded when it comes to life elsewhere. The things that we assume to be fundamental to life, just because they are universal to life here on Earth, may just be accidents of how life emerged and evolved in the context of our own planet. Which begs the question, if this is the case, how might we hope to detect truly alien life? To find truly alien life, I think we need to develop a framework for agnostic biosignatures. This is a corner of astrobiology that is just beginning to come into its own in the past few years. Let me break down these words for you. A biosignature is just a feature that indicates or suggests the presence of life. And we tack on this word agnostic to say that this biosignature is not specific to life as we know it here on Earth, and that it's capable of detecting unfamiliar life forms too. So to introduce my philosophy for agnostic biosignatures, let me turn to another first contact with a wildly different kind of life. This is the Kala Moraine from the TNG episode Deja Q. These beings are plasma-based, so they're completely different from anything remotely like life as we know it. Let me share the dialogue from this episode where the crew scans the calamarine and concludes that it is a life form. Worf reports, energy patterns are reading as highly organized, to which the computer says, signal patterns indicate intelligence. The highlights here, patterns, organized, patterns, intelligence, are indicative of where I'm going with this, of what I think is important to understand about agnostic biosignatures. And that is that life is complicated, that life is a complex system. 
and complexity is maximized somewhere between complete orderliness and complete and utter chaos. One might say that life is a system in which information has structured flows of matter and energy, and that structuring leads to complexity that can form the foundation for agnostic approaches for searching for life. So what I'm going to do for you here is share with you four examples of agnostic biosignatures that have been developed by astrobiologists in recent years. Now, th on this whirlwind tour, we're going to encounter words that sound like technobabble pulled straight from a Star Trek episode, but I promise you they are all real scientific terms, and I'm just so excited to be able to share them with you. So the first of these methods is something called chemometric fingerprinting. This was developed by Georgetown University professor Sarah Stewart Johnson and her colleagues. The idea here is basically to use different strands of DNA as different colored sticky notes. So the more complex your sample is, the more different DNA strands you'd expect it to bind with. So a simple sample, like a non-living crystal, you'd expect will only interact with maybe like one or two different kinds of DNA. But a complex sample, like the cell membrane of an alien life form, may interact with all kinds of DNA. So in this method, we are basically getting a handle on complexity through the diversity of DNA sequences that the sample interacts with. The next method is the molecular assembly index. This is a strategy that was pioneered by Glasgow University professor Lee Cronin and his colleagues. And it basically asks how many transformations must I make to construct an object of interest, whether it's a series of building blocks or letters to form a word or chemical bonds to create a molecule of interest. Basically, we're measuring complexity here as the number of unique steps that it takes to construct a molecule. I like to think of this as the Lego block principle. You know, you go to the Lego store and you buy a Lego set, and if the instruction booklet that comes with it is super, super thin, you know that's a simple set. But if the instruction booklet that comes with it looks more like a dictionary, then you know you're going to be investing a lot of time, energy, and information processing into creating that final product. The cool thing is that the molecular assembly index seems to be able to differentiate between molecules that only life can make and molecules that can be created without life. What I'm showing you here are four different molecules and some of their assembly pathways, ATP, penicillin, tryptophan, and asparagine, all right? All four of these molecules are used in life, but life is the only process that is known to be able to make ATP and penicillin whereas tryptophan and asparagine are simple enough that geological processes can make them too. So there seems to be a cutoff around molecular assembly index 15 or so, where above that, life is the only thing we know that can make those molecules. And below that, it could be life or it could be some abiotic process. Next, I wanna share with you a technique pioneered by my friend and colleague, Stuart Bartlett at Caltech. Stewart and his team have devised a way to measure the complexity of a planet as a whole. Given a series of observations of that planet over time, you can ask, what is the minimal model required to reproduce the data that you took? In this method, complexity is measured by the size of the model needed to reconstruct your data set. And so what Stuart and his team did was he took a series of observations from the Earth and Jupiter and degraded that data to what would be seen if these were extrasolar worlds far away from Earth. And plotted here is the statistical complexity of those measurements for Earth in Cyan and Jupiter in Magenta. And what you can see here is that Earth's complexity on average is a good 50% greater than Jupiter's across all of these different wavelengths or colors of observation. And that this may be related to the activity of a thriving biosphere on our own planet. Finally, let me tell you about some exciting work that we're doing right here at the Carnegie Institution for Sciences Earth and Planets Laboratory. I'm leading a study with my colleagues Anarud Prabhu, Jason Williams, Shauna Morris, and Bob Hazen, and many others on how to interpret the network topologies of planetary atmospheres to get a handle on their complexity and to look for signs of life. 
What I'm showing you here are networks of different planetary atmospheres, Titan, Venus, early Earth, and modern Earth. And the nodes or circles that you're seeing are different chemicals in those atmospheres that are linked together by reactions. The color and size of the nodes tell you how important that particular node is to the network as a whole. And so what we're trying to do is find a way to get a gauge on complexity through the structure of the relationships among the molecules in an atmosphere. And what's really cool is that our preliminary work has shown that you can actually differentiate Earth's atmospheric uh, network topology from that of other planets in our solar system. And not only is Earth's uh, network different from those of other planets, but it seems to be more similar to living networks. So on the bar graph that I'm showing you on the right, Earth's network's homogeneity seems to be different from that of other planets and more similar to those green bars, which are a metabolic network from a cell, a neural network from the brain, and a marine food web network uh, from, obviously, a food web, <laughs> an ecosystem. So as somebody who studies planetary atmospheres and their co-evolution with life on a planet, I was incredibly struck by this moment in Star Trek Discovery, where the crew is struggling to communicate with the enigmatic species 10C. Remember, these are those gas giant dwellers who communicate through uh, chemical pheromones. And there comes this moment where the crew needs to tell the 10C, you are hurting us but they're struggling with how to convey the concept of us. And they bounce around various ideas, maybe some of them the number six, because six is the atomic number of carbon. But that might be a little too vague. Maybe send them the DNA sequence of one of our humans, but that might be too specific. And that's when Captain Michael Burnham has this amazing insight. She says, the air, the exact ratio of gases we need to breathe, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.93% argon, 0.4% carbon dioxide. They will recognize that as us. And here's why I think that is so beautiful, because the chemical composition of our atmosphere is a reflection of billions of years of coevolution with the biology on our world. It is an ambassador to the cosmos for this complex, dynamic, persistent, and innovative process that we call life. It is a signal to the universe that we're here, that we exist, and the 10C knew how to read this message and divine the hidden complexity in these numbers. And I am trying to make sure through our research at Carnegie that we are capable of doing that too. So I know we're almost out of time before we need to bring on our glorious panel, but before we transition to that, let's try to put our knowledge here to the test. And let's do that by bringing things close to home through Star Trek Picard's second season. This season takes place in the year 2024, just a few years from now, in a city called Los Angeles. Our heroes from the future have come back through time to ensure that the launch of a crewed mission to Europa proceeds as planned. This is Rene Picard, one of Captain Jean-Luc Picard's distant ancestors, one of the astronauts on the Europa mission who is destined to find evidence of the first alien life known to humanity. So let's say that you are Rene Picard. What are you going to look for? Well, just as a reminder, Europa is a moon of Jupiter and a prime astrobiological target. In fact, NASA is currently constructing a mission called the Europa Clipper mission. This is a real-life mission to go to this moon and search for signs of habitability and inhabitants. Europa is a so-called ocean world because beneath its thick ice shell hides a vast global ocean of liquid water. Not only does it have liquid water, we think that it has the right fluxes of reductants or food from hydrothermal vents and oxidants or quote-unquote air from the radiolysis of its ice surface that could support a thriving biosphere underneath of that ice. Remember, life is flux. You've got to eat and you've got to breathe. And yes, you need to excrete too. So the gases that life exhales may be a good biosignature. But there's a real big twist to this story. 
You see, according to Jean-Luc Picard's history books, Rene Picard is not destined to find life on Europa. She's destined to find life on its sister moon, Io. And my jaw dropped when I heard him say these words, because although Io is an ocean world just like Europa, its ocean is of a completely different nature. Io's ocean is a magma ocean. It is made of liquid molten rock. So any life that exists on Io would be of a fundamentally different nature to that of life on Earth. So again, I put this question to you. If you were Rene Picard peering out your window at Io in search of truly alien life, what would you look for? Now, I realize this is an extremely daunting question, but I promise if you've been paying attention to this lecture for the past 30 minutes, you already know the answer. Number one, you would look for a diversity of chemical components and you wouldn't discount anything because life on Io would certainly not have the same biochemistry as life on Earth. This is our lesson from the Horta. Number two, you would search for active fluxes of material that corresponds to what life would do on Io, not to what life would do on Earth. This is our lesson from species 10C. And finally, you would look for complexity, structures or patterns that are indicative of functionality that could have only been created by an evolutionary process. This is our lesson from the Calamarain. These are the three things that I think you'd want to look for to identify life as we do not know it. In fact, if I had to venture a guess, these are the three things that a tricorder scans for when it is looking for biosigns or what you would look for if you were trying to find those precious little life forms from space. Now, look, I am not an official Star Trek science consultant. I have no idea why a tricorder is called a tricorder. But if I had to make something up in my head canon, this would be it. These are the three elements of agnostic biosignatures. These are the ways that you would seek out new life. And the amazing thing is, scientists are working on them right now. You don't have to wait till the 24th century to be the next Catherine Janeway or Lieutenant Commander Data. You can join us today as we explore space, the final frontier. Your starship is waiting. The future is yours. And I'll see you out there. You can all see here the moment from the voyage home where Scotty uh, shares the secrets to transparent aluminum. And uh, if you can see there on this very old um, Macintosh, it's uh, meant to be a, mix a mixture of aluminum, silver, hydrogen, which um, I don't know, they may be taking some liberties there on, on the, the science of uh, the bonding of those elements, but uh, the answer is yes, it, it, it does exist. Um, though in reality, it's a much more complicated uh, structure, um, but there is a material called aluminum oxynitride that companies set, manufacture and sell at, and brand it as transparent aluminum. And, you know, true to Star Trek, it is one of the most, uh, one of the hardest materials of its kind. It's used for things um, such as you know, optical devices uh, and bulletproof um, protective glass. Um, but I don't know if they've tested it on you know, photon torpedoes just yet. I don't know if we'll be able to make starships out of it. But Star Trek was right on the money here. There is a form of transparent aluminum that is incredibly hard and um, incredibly resistant to, like I said, bullets and other projectiles. So they were, uh, they were right there. And, um, you know, uh, you know, when it, as this relates to my work, um, you know, I research the behavior of uh, materials at extremes. So um, this material, transparent aluminum, is is um, synthesized under some funky conditions. You need to use a, an inert nitrogen atmosphere uh, and heat mixture of the pre of uh, aluminum and other precursors to thousands of degrees Celsius to to get uh, aluminum oxynitride. Um, I research how uh, extreme pressures uh, affect materials. And um, you know, when I when I say extreme, I mean pressures that are hundreds of thousands times that of Earth's atmosphere. Um, and when we do this, we can make materials like aluminum oxide, the transparent aluminum that you know have these seemingly fantastical properties that we see in Star Trek. You know, again, some more here. 
We have uh, type six and nine shuttles that have um, the tritanium holes or the class F shuttle that has uh, a geranium hull that are you know incredibly hard materials, ultra hard alloys. And um, you know, while on Star Trek, they have the luxury of uh, flying around the galaxy uh, to uh, find planets where uh, all these alloys occur naturally. Uh, in the lab, I, I try and find ways of making analogous materials here on Earth and seeing if we can do it. I, I work on what are, uh, sounds incredibly fantastical, uh, flexible diamonds. So um, we make these by taking small molecules um, that um, stack quite, you know, in nice, these nice uh, rows. Um, think of like a stack of pancakes, right? E each one of these molecules is sat on top of the other. And if we put force uh, on those uh, molecules, we can for cause a solid state reaction to film this long chain of uh, diamonds, a diamond like coast. These carbon-carbon these bonds are exactly the same as those you would find in diamonds uh, that you all know and, and love. Um, but they are only one direction as opposed to um, conventional diamonds, which, which have these carbon-carbon bonds in all three directions. And if you just think of a normal wire, if you make this uh, chain of diamonds long enough, you can uh, should be able to bend it and flex it. And um, these materials are predicted to combine the, um, the incredible properties of diamond, the strength, the chemical and thermal stability with uh, the flexibility of conventional polymers like polystyrene that you come into contact uh, every day. And to do that, we use what's called the diamond anvil cell, which is here on the left. And to exert these huge pressures required for these reactions to occur, we have to squish the molecules between the tips of diamonds. So this is a picture of a diamond anvil cell to the left and the zoom in there on the uh, actual tips of the diamonds where we put a little bit of sample, a ruby to control uh, to measure the pressure so we know how many thousands, hundreds of thousands of times uh, atmospheric pressure we're at. And from that, we can do a, a whole host of various characterization techniques and um, find out if we're making these flexible diamonds. And we can also scale them in the lab using um, various other um, methods, uh, Paris Edinburgh Press there uh, in the center and uh, uh, multi anvil Press. So we can actually make, um, you know, hundreds of milligrams at the moment of these materials, but enough to play with to fully characterize, to um, gain a deeper understanding of their, their properties and, uh, you know, what we can use them for. A lot of theorized um, uh, uh, uses, uh, you know, wearable fabrics that are uh, diamond-like, uh, so incredibly resistant, protective fabrics, uh, you know, uh, things like that. One of the pie-in-the-sky ones, and this is how we link back to uh, Star Trek again, is a space elevator is uh, one that has been uh, well proposed. And for those of you who can potentially, if, you know, um, props to those of you who can remember this deep, deep cut uh, Voyager reference, but Star Trek again has predicted that such a thing would exist. So if we look here, this is Voyager season three, episode 19, Rise. And this is wonderful, um, I guess, CG work that is meant to be a planet with what they class as an orbital tether, but is the same thing as a space elevator. Uh, and the point of having a space elevator would be because, you know, we're very good at launching rockets into space. But in theory, if you have a, a, a space elevator or an orbital tether, you can just climb up the orbital tether and not have to use giant rockets and burn all that fuel to get up into space. You can just climb up the tether and then eventually break the pull of gravity and get into space. Though Voyager does also have a warning for us that there are a number of uh, OSHA violations that are potentially uh, there with a space elevator. So, um, you know, it is a cautionary tale, but as you can see here, uh, although this poor uh, person is falling out of the space elevator, you can see the pod that they would climb up in and as it's, it's going up into the atmosphere and climbing up into space and you'd use it to transport whatever you wanted up to your space shuttle. So we're talking right now, in terms of this picture, about a planet that's very similar to Earth. This is a Class M planet, in this instance it's at Bajor. And these planets have plate tectonics and a lot of liquid water, much like Earth. So I think, yes, if aliens seeded an Earth-like planet, probably life as we know it would thrive. 
Now, during your lecture, you did talk a little bit about the possibilities for life in atmospheres, but since I'm a geologist, I want to think about rocky planets specifically, those terrestrial planets. So if a planet isn't M-class, could life thrive on its surface? Now, that's where the science we do at Carnegie comes in. In my research, I'm interested in whether life can thrive on exoplanets, those planets that are outside of our solar system. I do experiments to see what kinds of surfaces those exoplanets might have. So to do that, I make lava in my lab, and this is a machine I use, it's called a piston cylinder. And here I look at the exoplanet lava's chemical composition that I've made. I'm interested in lava, first of all, because volcanoes are awesome, right? And second of all, because lava becomes the newest surface of a planet. In this image of a volcano eruption, you can see that the lava is already starting to cool and harden into a new surface. We can look at the composition of that new surface and see if any of the organisms we know of are able to survive on it. But we do also know that life can survive in places that we wouldn't expect. So some of you might have heard of extremophiles. Now, these are organisms that live in extreme environments. Now you might remember that giant tardigrade ripper from Discovery. Now tardigrades are actually real organisms that can survive being exposed to all kinds of things, outer space, radiation, and high pressures and temperatures. There are also some extremophiles that live around hydrothermal vents that are deep in the ocean. You might have heard these vents referred to as black smokers or white smokers. Now, these are high temperature, high pressure environments that are full of sulfur, not unlike class Y demon planets, which are supposed to be very hot and very sulfurous. Now we're learning new things every day about what kinds of environments could possibly support life. And remember, there are classes of planets that I haven't shown you here today that aren't technically habitable by humans, but they can support other species, other sentient species, even in the Star Trek universe, or they could be good targets for terraforming. So would terrestrial exoplanets be receptive to life via planispermia? I'm going to be optimistic and say probably. And that wasn't the only uh, episode or movie that showed the atmospheres uh, of planets from within. So here are just some uh, examples. Starship Down was mentioned, right? Uh, where um, the Defiant was chased into a gas giant's atmosphere. Extreme Risk was another one in Voyager where I believe they lost a probe uh, in another giant planet atmosphere and the Malon were after it. And so they had to build a whole new shuttle to go and get it. Uh, Sleeping Dogs Enterprise, where they went down to rescue some Klingons. And just recently, uh, Memento Mori, or Mori, I don't know, from Strange New Worlds, the Enterprise had to hide inside a brown dwarf or a gas giant. They didn't really make it clear, <laughs> um, where again, it was very hazy and cloudy. And so um, this was very, all very interesting to me. My research um, uh, focuses on the atmospheres of planets and exoplanets. And in particular, I'm interested in the formation of clouds and hazes in these atmospheres because they tend to block our prying eyes from looking deeper into these atmospheres and trying to understand compositions and atmospheric and planetary origins. And so, you know, at first glance, what do you see? A lot of these uh, images show kind of orangey, purpley, brown, dark colors. Uh, and this is actually similar to some extent to what we have in real life. So here is a really nice picture showing uh, the planet Saturn and the hazy moon Titan, this brownish thing right, right in the foreground. And both of these worlds have layers of aerosols or hazes uh, that are a product of photochemistry, which is where simple molecules in the atmosphere gets broken down by high energy radiation like UV photons and which leads to uh, very complex chemical reactions that form small particles. And these particles just hang out um, in the atmosphere. And so speaking of Titan, you know, another instance where a starship when no starship uh, uh, gone before is of course, when the Enterprise hid inside Titan's atmosphere to, to, to get it to you know, be undetected uh, by neural space uh, starship in the 2009 Star Trek movie. So, you know, from, you know, to, from looking at it, it seems like Star Trek's got it right. A lot of these atmospheres are kind of brown and, 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 and kind of orangey, you know, and like Mike said, soupy. 
Um, and one reason for this is that a lot of these uh, chemicals absorb UV, absorb UV and blue light, actually. And so what gets scattered out is red light. And that's why they all look red and orange. And so, you know, that's, that's pretty good. Now, in real life, we can't park uh, a starship inside uh, an atmosphere, a hazy one or cloudy one or clear one, whatever. I wish we could. Uh, but what we can do for uh, planets in our own solar system is to sand probes, actually much like what Voyager did in Extreme Risk. And so this is a nice um, artist impression of the landing of the Huygens probe on the surface of Titan. So this was part of the Cassini mission that took place throughout the 2000s. And when Cassini got to the Saturn system and launched the Huygens probe, it parachuted through the atmosphere, sent, uh, eventually landed on the surface, and took amazing measurements of the atmosphere, uh, showing uh, that it is full of these hazes that are likely organic. Now, for planets and, and brown dwarfs outside of our solar system, what can we do? We can't actually go there. We don't have warp drive, unfortunately. Uh, so the best thing, uh, next best thing, is to observe these worlds with uh, telescopes, space telescopes, ground-based telescopes, what have you. So this figure shows the brightness variations of a brown dwarf. And the bottom axis is time. The y-axis, the vertical axis, is just brightness, essentially. It can show how it varies and if variations are not regular at all eventually, uh, it's essentially actually goes, uh, the amplitude gets higher and higher and higher. This was observed using the dearly departed Spitzer Space Telescope. And what they backed out from this light curve is that this brown dwarf had to have cloud bands with clear spaces in between. And the clear spaces where you see deeper down and you get higher, brighter light because it's hot down there. And so they made a nice movie, which may remind you of the Strange New Worlds uh, episode, uh, showing how these different cloud bands and cloud holes crisscrossed each other as this uh, brown dwarf rotated, and that's how they get these uh, variations. So this is, you know, this is still an artist's impression, but it's based on the Spitzer observations. And so uh, what we hope to do here at Carnegie is to use the next generation uh, telescopes that do something similar to characterize exoplanet atmospheres, including their clouds and hazes. And the one that we're really looking forward to is the uh, JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is due to uh, put out their first images in less than a month, and we are freaking the freaking out <laughs> because it's coming so soon. And so, you know, in early July, uh, mid-July, I should say, mid to late July, we'll see our first images and we'll get our first observations of uh, these strange new worlds. Detected water vapor in more than 20 exoplanet atmospheres. And I just wanna pause to reflect on the fact that, you know, how, how crazy that is, right? Unlike in Star Trek, we're not sending probes to these planets because they're too far away. We can't go and visit them. <clears throat> and yet from distances of, you know, even over a hundred light years away, we can tell that there's water vapor in those atmospheres. I think that's amazing. <laughs> um, but uh, it is a challenging measurement to make. And that means that most of these detections are in the types of planets that are easiest for us to see at the moment, which are planets that are, are quite big and quite hot. So uh, for most of these planets where we have water detections, they are what we call hot Jupiters. So they are planets that are around the size of Jupiter or even a bit bigger, and they're hot because they're orbiting very close to their stars, and that makes them more accessible for us uh, to observe them. Um, so this is one of the these data sheets. And when I saw this for the first time, I thought, huh, this kind of looks like some of the planet properties files that I use with my code. Um, actually, some of, some of these things that we're seeing on this data sheet are things that we really can measure for exoplanets. I should say as a disclaimer, there are also things that we can't measure yet. So on the right-hand side, we're seeing, uh, you know, different kinds of life forms and stuff like that. So Mike, what you were saying in your talk, obviously, is, you know, some ways that we might be able to detect that in the future. We're not quite there yet. But let's have a look more on the left-hand side here. We have uh, things like the, the rotation period and the revolution period, so the, the length of a day or a year, uh, and also the estimated mass. So let's focus on that just for a second. Uh, this means if we have the mass of a planet, that we can weigh it. <laughs> So how do we do that? You know, we can't put it on a scale, right? So I'm going to show you how we weigh a planet uh, with this little movie. 
Um, and so basically when we picture a planet orbiting a star, usually we imagine the star being fixed and the planet going around it, but actually both the planet and the star are both orbiting their common center of gravity, which means that the planet is causing the star to wobble a little bit. It's, a, it's kind of exaggerated in this movie, um, but that wobbling means that the light that comes from the star uh, also has a bit of a wobble in it that we call a Doppler shift. And the, the size of that wobble depends on the mass of the exoplanet orbiting the star, which is how we then take that Doppler shift and reverse it and, and try to calculate the mass of the planet. Um, but another way, uh, another type of measurement that we do to learn more about these exoplanets is uh, what we call the transit method. Uh, so it's good to use different methods to put together as much information as we can about these planets. And so this method that I'm about to show you relies on uh, when an exoplanet passes in front of its star relative to us as the observer. Let's play this. You can see the planet passing in front of the star. And when it does that, the planet is blocking out a little bit of light from the planet. So let's just pause it here. The smaller planet, when it passed in front of the star, blocked out a little bit of light, and the bigger planet blocked out a larger chunk of light. So if we sit and stare at a star for a long time and we just see the brightness dipping periodically, we can infer that the planet is passing in front of it as it goes round and round its orbit. And depending on how big that dip in brightness is, we can figure out the radius or the size of the planet. And so those, those are two really important measurements for us to, to learn more about, about these planets. But let's, let's go back to this data sheet. The other thing that I want to point out, which we were kind of talking about with the water, is the atmospheric composition. So on this data sheet, we're seeing there's 79% nitrogen, 19% oxygen. There are some kind of crazy things on here, like tungsten as well. <laughs> Maybe that's a little bit too crazy. But we really can uh, learn about the chemistry of these atmospheres. Um, we're doing that for exoplanets right now. And so how do we how do we do that? How can we look at a planet that far away and figure out what the atmosphere is made of? Again, um, this is something that we can do using the transit method when the planet happens to be in this really convenient location in between us and the star that it's orbiting. So on this in this movie, on the left we have the host star of the planet, then we have the exoplanet in the middle with its atmosphere, and we're looking at it from the right hand side of the movie. And so as light from the star passes through the atmosphere of that planet, some of the light goes straight through and goes straight to, to our telescopes, but some of the light is absorbed or scattered by these different molecules. And we can know how those molecules scatter and absorb light through uh, experiments in the lab and calculations. And so from Earth, we can see, okay, which colors of light are missing from our observations and we can reverse that and figure out which molecules are in the atmosphere to create uh, that, that detection. So that's how, for example, we can detect water in the atmospheres. We've also detected other species like sodium and potassium as well, which is really cool. And before I kind of mentioned a little teaser of this planet called uh, K218b, this is one of my favorites. Um, I thought, well, since, since that data sheet reminded me of real data that we have, why don't I make my own data sheet for this real life exoplanet that we know of, uh, that we've measured a bunch of stuff for. So K218b is a kind of planet called mini Neptune. Its size is in between the size of Earth and Neptune, and we don't have any planet of that size in the solar system. So it's, it's one of these really funky, cool new planets uh, that we've discovered. And actually, of all the planets, exoplanets that have been discovered so far, uh, this is the most common type. And yet we don't have any in the solar system. That's kind of cool, right? <laughs> Peter was talking about the diversity uh, of exoplanets and, and the universe. That is really is true. So we know that the mass of K218b is about 8.63 Earth masses. It's a little bit bigger than the Earth as well, 2.61 Earth radii. And we've also been able to detect the presence of water vapor in an atmosphere. So using that method that I showed on the, in the previous video, we've worked out that the atmosphere of this planet is mostly made of hydrogen, but it could have between uh, less than a percent or up to about 15% of water vapor in its atmosphere. 
and uh, the James Webb Space Telescope that Peter mentioned before will be returning to look at this exoplanet again and we'll hone down uh, more information about its atmosphere and its composition. So this data sheet will get even richer uh, as time goes on. Okay, welcome to Sky for the Month for September 2022. Um, of course, we'll go into a bit of the next month prior to the uh, uh, next meeting. Things happening uh, to watch for for this month. Uh, full moon occurred on the 10th of the night, so uh, we passed the full moon. Uh, it wasn't a super moon for a change. And uh, new moon occurs on the 26th of the night. So get a few clear skies in. You might be able to photograph a little bit of these nice stuff. To look for, uh, Neptune's in opposition on the 17th, which was four days ago. So it's pretty close to opposition now. Best time to try and find it. Good luck. It's uh, there between Saturn and uh, Jupiter. Comet Pan-Stars, uh, 0.4 degrees west of Rose Scorpio. Been hanging around the head of Scorpio uh, for the last month or so, and it moves into Lupus uh, in the next next few weeks or so. Um, we'll get a star chart shortly. And we'll see where Lupus is relevant relevant to the head of uh, Scorpio. Moon is at apogee um, on the twentieth, uh, which was yesterday, furthest uh, position from the uh, Earth. So if you're looking at a it's not quite a full moon, but if you're looking at it, it will appear as small as it gets. Uh, on the 23rd of the night, uh, two days time, we had the spring equinox. So uh, I think it's been pretty notable to most people that the, the days are definitely getting longer. And also on the 23rd, Mercury is an inferior conjunction, which for the newer members, it means it's directly between the Sun and Earth at the moment. So not a real good spot to build. And uh, if it had been more cooperative and been on the same plane as us, we'd have had a transit. But because of the difference uh, in its relative position to the uh, plane, um, it unfortunately won't uh, give us a transit. Uh, Jupiter is our position on the 27th of the 9th, which essentially means uh, it's directly overhead, slightly north of us, uh, at midnight. And uh, this is the best time to be uh, viewing these planets, these outer planets, uh, in opposition, although due to the size and proximity, that uh, essentially means it's pretty good to view most of the time. It's up. Uh, on the 5th uh, of next month, Moon's at Perigee, which is the opposite of Apogee, it's uh, its closest approach. And um, given it occurs not long after a, uh, a new moon, Probably not going to be, uh, well, whatever crescent is there, it's going to be fairly sizable. And uh, you get an idea of just how fast Mercury orbits the Sun on the 9th of next month. And if you look there, um, Imperial conjunction on the 23rd, by the 9th, it's heading out to maximum elongation. In other words, as far away from the Sun, laterally, in, in appearance, that it gets, uh, and the best time to observe it. Because it's gone through inferior conjunction, it's gone between us and the sun, it'll pop out the other side, it will now become a morning object. And apparently because of the relativity of the planes, it's not going to be all that high above the horizon, so stay in bed. And uh, on the 10th of the 10th, uh, we get the Southern Taurus leave your shower maximum. Uh, and I'll cover that a little bit further uh, later on. So, uh, looking at the night sky, uh, this is 10 pm, uh, well, probably uh, a little before 10 pm now. Uh, as you can see, Southern Cross is uh, fairly low to the horizon, and Amiga Centauri is, uh, is down there with it. Um, the large Magellanic cloud is, uh, because the whole thing kind of turns that way a little bit, uh, you've got this other uh, large Magellanic cloud coming up, bringing with it the Tarantula Nebula, which is an object uh, in the that cloud. You're really desperate to see a, uh, a globular cluster, uh, 47 Tucana is quite high now, very easy to find because it's right next to the uh, small Magellanic cloud. 
Okay, there are other ones. Uh, we go over here to the head of Scorpio, Ed Tares. There's also a globular cluster next to that as well. Okay, so this is where Pan Stars is at the moment, and it's moving into Lucas over the next couple of weeks. So if you look at the head of Scorpio and follow its uh, claws, if you like, in a, a southerly direction, you'll move into Lucas. So, yes? Can I get you? Oh, it can't be you. Oh, magnitude? Oh, magnitude mm -hmm. is about, no, I'll cover it a bit further uh, later on, but it's about six magnitude. So in terms of commentary, it's pretty big. And looking to the north, um, I think the, uh, the interesting thing there is uh, Andromeda uh, coming up above the northern horizon there. Probably you can't really see it from here because uh, obviously Melbourne is north of us and there's too much light pollution. So if you want to get up north of Melbourne, find yourself a nice flat northern horizon, uh, you've got a, a reasonable shot at getting the Andromeda galaxy uh, over just the next few months. Uh, the planets. Okay, as I said, Mercury moves into inferior conjunction on the 23rd and uh, fairly quickly returns to the morning sky. You'll see this is a pattern with both Mercury and Venus. And after they go through inferior junction, they'll go from an evening object to a morning object. Uh, the beauty, as I said, with Mercury is it moves fairly quick. It orbits about four times in the same time we orbit at once. Uh, and according to uh, the information that I had, it's, uh, it's not very far above the horizon, so it may not be all that uh, easy to spot unless you've got a nice flat uh, eastern horizon. Uh, Venus, about too close to the sun because it's moving into superior conjunction, which means it's in conjunction with the sun, but it's on over the other side of the sun from where Earth is. Okay, so in the next few months, once it moves out of superior conjunction, it will return to the evening sky. Okay. Uh, we won't miss it. Venus is, uh, is usually the brightest object up there. Earth, southern spring equinox on the 23rd, and uh, I think anyone who's been out observing lately will notice that the days are definitely getting longer. The outer planets, Mars, rising now about midnight. Okay, I think uh, opposition occurs in October or November for Mars, so uh, over the next few weeks, uh, so long as the cloud stays away, we're going to start being able to look at Mars. It'll also start to increase in apparent size as we move closer to it. Now, the interesting thing here is it's not moving to us, we're actually catching it. Uh, at the moment, it's in Taurus, not far from the high age cluster, but uh, it's not a hard one to spot. It, it's quite red even to the naked eye. Jupiter, uh, Jupiter is fairly high uh, now, certainly rising at a much more respectable time. Around about, uh, oh, about 9, 9.30, it's actually in a, a quite a good spot. Uh, it's up about 30 degrees or so. Uh, Saturn, it's just past opposition, uh, so around 10 p.m. it's quite high in the sky. And uh, it's, a, it's another one that's fairly easy uh, to spot on the uh, equatorial plane. Uh, could be plain, sorry. And uh, between them is, uh, is Neptune. But uh, Neptune needs a fairly reasonable sized telescope of at least about four inches and fairly high power and good seeing. So you really need everything in your favour to see a little blue dot. And uh, Uranus now uh, rising about 10 pm, which is actually probably not going to be high enough to really see nicely until uh, about 11. But uh, as you can see here, you've got all four of the uh, gas planet, outer gas planets in the sky now for uh, a reasonable part of the evening. And Mars isn't too far away. Appearance of the planets, uh, Mercury, uh, as it's going into inferior conjunction, we're obviously looking at the unlit back of it. Uh, it is tidally locked with the sun, so I guess uh, one side gets baked, the other side gets uh, fairly cold. And uh, if you can see it, uh, well, if you can't see it now, it's 
really been wanted in the sun. Uh, Venus, on the other hand, is, is going through the other side. And so uh, if you could see it, you would see its face. So uh, I guess that's for anyone who's got access to the Hubble or the James Webb Telescope who uh, wants to have a look at those planets go through your life. <coughs> Mars, uh, still showing it with a little bit of a crescent there. It's just past what's known as its quadrature, which is a 90 degree angle between Earth, Mars and the Sun. And uh, it's when you'll see it with its uh, a maximum uh, give us appearance, give us appearance. appearance. And uh, as it moves around into opposition, we'll uh, see more of its face. I'm not sure where it, uh, check where it is in relation to its orbit, but hopefully it's a little further out so the solar wind doesn't stir up too much dust and we can see a few uh, surface details. Uh, Saturn, uh, very, fairly bright, uh, just sheer size, the fact it's got its rings there also help with its reflectivity, the rings are still tilted <coughs> towards us. And uh, each year you see Saturn, you'll notice the rings will actually close over the next few years. And in 2025, we'll pass a bit close to, through the ring plane. And you'll be able to see Saturn without its rings. Won't be without it, it's just too big to see. And uh, Jupiter, uh, absolutely huge. Can't miss Jupiter, it's uh, second brightest to Venus. And uh, the things you're looking for on Jupiter really are these, these bands. The flattening of the poles. Uh, Jupiter spins once on its axis every nine hours. So uh, it's actually it has about two, two and a half days at the time the Earth spins once. Because of that, it tends to, uh, it's a trivial force being what it is, it tends to widen it a little bit of the equator and flatten the poles there. The other thing obviously are its moons, to have a look at four big moons and uh, different configuration. When we were here the other night, uh, a couple of the moons actually passed in front of it. So we were having a bit of a look for uh, what are known as shadow transits, but the scene wasn't particularly good, so uh, we really couldn't sort of pick it out. But I think you need to use a bit of imagination. Uh, Uranus, not much bigger than Neptune. Uh, you can clearly see it's a disc and it generally has a bluey green colour. Uh, and uh, also a uh, telescope object, not quite as bad as, uh, as Neptune. And I'm not sure what the of that, but uh, I'll look through a 10 inch and it's definitely not that big. So Uranus is the two days you've seen, Mark, and the Neptune? Sorry, Phil. Uranus is a bit easier to see than Neptune? Yeah, uh, Uranus is about, uh, well, magnitude 5.7. So, probably kids have uh, got a chance of seeing it on a really dark night uh -huh. without the aid of a telescope. Adults will need a telescope, but you don't need the magnification to see it. Uh, and it's right on that edge of being visible and not visible. So, uh, for most of us, our eyes, uh, it's not visible without a telescope. Uh, and Neptune is definitely a telescope object. You probably get Neptune in yours, it will appear as just a little dot, but there's other little dots yeah. there with it, so it's, it's like it. trying to pick Pluto in the, uh, you know, in the constellation of um, Sagittarius at the moment, which is galactic centre, so a lot of dots around there. Okay, Comet Pan Stars is about six magnitudes, do it. Um, during September, it's been six magnitude for about the last month and a half. Uh, currently found in the head of uh, Scorpio, but towards the end of September, moves into Lupus. So remember, if you follow the, the claws of Scorpio in, towards the South Pole, you'll be able to find, they'll uh, have a, a shot of finding pan stars. It looks a little bit like uh, a globular cluster at the moment because it seems to be coming straight at us. Because of that, you're not getting a really good tail. Uh, ben Clarenbold took a photo of it last week and it, it looked more like a cluster than a comet. So, a bit disappointing, but you can sort of see a bit of tail there. And when your showers are southern tourists, from the 10th of September until the 20th of uh, November, best viewed late in the evening and early morning. And if you think about it, uh, in the early morning we're heading uh, the morning sky is the direction we're heading, so we tend to run into them rather than trying to have them catch us. Um, 
tend to be bright folk, moving meteors with the occasional specky fireball, around about five per hour. And uh, next month we get the northern Taurus, so look in the direction of Taurus, which I think rises to start at midnight. Uh, that's where you'd be looking for the meteors. Information was provided by Astronomy 2022 by uh, Wallace Laws and Northfield and Christians. Oh, okay. Happy to be. <laughs>
Now, Chalya Binks is, uh, before it hit the Earth, is estimated to have been about 20 meters in size. And a lot of times when people think about asteroid impacts, they think about the one that killed the dinosaurs, right? And so this is a very different scale of object that we're talking about. So down on the bottom uh, right corner is some text about this dinosaur killer asteroid, and it was 10 to 15 kilometers in size. And I'm happy to say that we are tracking all those asteroids, NASA is tracking all of those asteroids, and there are none of that size that are on a collision course with the Earth. So we're safe from these extinction level dinosaur killing events. But there's a lot of space between the Chelyabinsk size of 20 meters and these dinosaur killers of 10 kilometers, these few hundred meters objects. And in fact, one of these fell in Tunguska, Russia in 1908, and it was estimated to be between 60 to 190 meters in size. So there's sort of a few hundred meters, and it leveled forests as if they were just matchsticks blown over when this occurred. And this sort of event happens every few centuries. And so it's sort of these hundreds of meters diameter objects that we're really concerned about. And this population, we actually think we've only discovered a third of the objects this size that are out there. And so there's actually two thirds of this asteroid population that we're not sure where they are. What would something like this do if it actually hit the Earth? Well, Behringer Crater, Meteor Crater in Arizona is a nice example. Maybe some of you have been there. They have a great visitor center. It's a beautifully preferred impact a crater just outside, like near the Grand Canyon sort of area. And you can see that impact crater there. So this is believed to have formed from about a 50 meter asteroid that was made out of metal. So very, very dense asteroid, lots of energy. 50,000 years ago, hit into this region of Arizona. Um, and it made a crater, which is really nice. It's uh, about a kilometer in diameter, a few hundred meters deep, um, but the devastation caused from an event like this is much bigger than just the crater that you see today. And that's shown from this model of what the devastation would have been over on the right side. The fireball extending out to 10 kilometers, large animals killed or wounded to 24 kilometers, hurricane force winds out to 40 kilometers. And then you can take this same map and overlay it on DC. And you can just get a scale of what a devastating natural disaster event this would be, particularly in a heavily populated area. Consequently, because of this potential threat from the asteroids that are out there, um, there was a National Academy study that was commissioned. It's called Defending Planet Earth. So that was in 2010. And they uh, looked at this threat and they said, what is the main things that we should do? And their recommendation for the highest priority mission to do is to do this kinetic impactor technology demonstration, exactly what DART is doing. And this graph here, graphic from that report, sort of illustrates that. The y-axis is the size, and we've been talking a lot about the size, but the x-axis is equally important. And that's the warning time that you have to deal with this threat. Um, because the idea with all of this is definitely not to disrupt it, but to deflect it. So you're not trying trying to disrupt this object. You're trying to give it a small nudge and have lots of time for this small nudge to add up to a granger change of his path, avoiding a future collision with the Earth. If you have a large object, which is the top of that graphic, you need to give it a pretty big nudge even just to make a little bit of change in its position. But these are the dinosaur killers. These are the ones that are not really the threat that we're concerned about. It's this few hundred meters range of population where we think that there's about 5,000 potentially hazardous asteroids of sort of this 100 meter size, these PHAs on the graph there. And that's where kinetic impact or technology was judged to be the most mature in technology that you might want to do if one of these things was on a collision course with the Earth. And DART, you can see, is very well um, situated on this graph, sort of shown as that dotted blue line going across there. This 160 meter object that we're targeting is right where you want to test this kinetic impact or technology. What's 160 meters? I like to show this little fun graphic just to sort of like bring everybody into size because sometimes you talk about these scales and they don't really mean very much. Um, so 160 meters is, uh, you know, diameter is uh, bigger than the Statue of Liberty, smaller than the Eiffel Tower. It's kind of the size of a Great Pyramid or maybe a sports stadium or something like that. So you can kind of think about the Great Pyramids hurling towards the Earth. Um, you know, it's not a, a giant object. You know, the main Didymos A that we're not going to impact is, is much, much larger, but it's still sort of a, a considerable amount of mass and size. And Didymos really is the ideal target, and not just because it's the right size that I've been talking a lot about, but because of this double asteroid system. Uh, because we're going to change the path, not around the sun, but around this other asteroid. So the DART spacecraft comes in at over 15,000 miles per hour, and it's going to try to hit Didymos B nearly head on. And you can see the original orbit of Didymos B in the white line. And when you hit it nearly head on, you're going to change its orbit to sort of that blue line, about 1% change in its orbit. The blue line's a little exaggerated, but you get the idea. Hitting this thing head on, causing a deflection of this asteroid, 
around the main one. It's a you know, careful, well thought out test. But what's really important about this double asteroid test and being able to do it this way is that this spacecraft is going to be totally destroyed. It's not going to be able to measure how much of a deflection it made when, it, when this happens. Instead, we're going to use existing telescopes here on the Earth in order to make that crucial measurement. So it's a very cost effective way in order to do this focused first test of the demonstration. And that's actually why the choice for the impact date is in September of 2022, because that's when the t distance between Earth and the Didymos asteroid system is minimized. So you can get the highest quality data from your existing Earth-based telescopes in order to make this crucial measurement. It's very ingenious, actually, of doing this focused mission in order to demonstrate this technology for the first time. So there's a few other key technologies that I wanted to just mention briefly on DART, along with this overall kinetic impactor technology. And one of the most important ones is the Tominus Smart Nav system. And so we're targeting the smaller asteroid, but you won't actually be able to tell the difference between the smaller asteroid and the larger asteroid until the last hour of the mission. And so all of this has to be done on board to pick out the smaller asteroid in order to try to impact it into the center in order to make this deflection. And so that builds on a lot of APL, uh, decades of missile guidance, algorithm development, and experience in order to do that. Um, there's only one payload on here. It's a camera named Draco. And Draco is modified from LORI, which was on the New Horizons mission, took amazing pictures of Pluto. Um, so we're using that technology. It's also going to be the first flight of NASA's Next Sea Ion Propulsion Engine, which is going to be more powerful than anything NASA's flown before. It's also using these rollout solar arrays, which are going to be deployed in space and roll out. And when they're deployed, they're going to be 19 meters from tip to tip. So a pretty, pretty sizable spacecraft there. But DART is just one part of NASA's overall planetary defense strategy. You would never just do DART in isolation. Equally important is to assess what's out there, to keep track of those things, to search, detect, and track, find these new objects that we have yet to discover in our population, characterize these objects so you know what you're dealing with, and uh, if you did have to deal with them, plan, coordinate. This is an international effort, and these are international working groups to deal with these issues. And finally, there's mitigate. And that's where DART comes in. If there is a threat and you need to be do something about it, let's be ready. Let's do this technology demonstration now. So you would think that this makes a lot of sense, but actually this effort's been growing considerably. NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office, which leads this effort, was only established in 2016. And so before there, there was a few activities going on, but they weren't very well coordinated. So since then, NASA has taken a much more concerted approach, and DART is the first spacecraft mission that's being flown by NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office, hence NASA's first planetary defense mission. So along with this Planetary Defense Coordination Office getting set up for NASA, there's been really increased visibility for planetary defense at the top levels of NASA. So this is the NASA Administrator attending the International Academy of Astronomics Planetary Defense Conference held just down the road here a few months ago. And stressing, he did the opening address, which was also broadcast on the web, and so worldwide people were watching this, stressing the fundamental importance of planetary defense efforts to our planet. And at this conference, it was much more than just NASA. This really is an international effort. There were more than 250 attendees from 20 plus countries. And uh, DART was very well represented. We had a number of presentations that went over well. But one of the unique things about this conference is there's an exercise that's done. So a hypothetical asteroid impact coming towards the Earth. And by day five, I've shown what the graphic looked like up there. There was a 60 meter object headed towards Manhattan. And it was going to be a thousand times more powerful than the bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima. And so you can see where this would be a very big natural disaster if it happened, just to reiterate that point. And this conference had not just scientists and engineers, but policymakers, people from FEMA, people from the press talking about how you would communicate these sorts of events. And so planetary defense as a whole, as a topic, is really increasing in the efforts, both within uh, NASA and internationally. So DART is an important demonstration of this kinetic impactor deflection technology, but it's also sort of pioneering the way for these future planetary defense efforts in a field that's really growing right now. I know I feel privileged to be part of the DART team that's working on this to make the first planetary defense mission a reality. Thank you.
spacecraft, impact, asteroid, what? You think science fiction, but this is real. I'm Justina Sorovitz, and I help tell the story of the DART mission. DART is the double asteroid redirection test. It is NASA's first planetary defense test mission. We're sending a spacecraft to a double asteroid system. We're going to hit the smaller asteroid with that spacecraft and see if we can nudge that asteroid in space. Hitting the asteroid is going to prove out whether this technique is something that we could rely on were there ever to be a hazard facing the planet. I'm a public affairs officer at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. What I do is tell the story of this very exciting mission through press releases, through videos, through all sorts of different communications avenues. As a kid, I was always drawn to creative fields. At some point, I got lost in stories, and it just became very easy to talk about these fantastic missions. It's something that impacts humanity, so it's very important to make sure that people understand. The DART mission is first and foremost most the first experiment of its kind. There is no immediate threat to Earth. We want to make sure that we can go out there and prepare and be ready. It's very easy to kind of think Armageddon or Deep Impact. So what we do is try to get the facts out and to make sure that people are getting accurate information versus just hearing sensational headlines. So as you can see behind me, this is actually the DART spacecraft right here. The solar arrays will actually roll out to 28 feet in length. It's amazing to be able to talk about it and share it with others. It's very cool just seeing how the spacecraft takes shape and how our storytelling takes shape as well. This is so exciting, this is so cool. Have you heard about this mission? We're going to an asteroid, oh, and we're gonna hit it. It's just like the basis of good storytelling. I still kind of pinch myself sometimes because it doesn't seem real. Planetary defense is finding asteroids before they find us, but then also maybe getting asteroids before they get us. <laughs> My name is Kelly Fast and I'm a planetary defender. In the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, I manage the Near Earth Object Observations Program. I handle the program that addresses finding the asteroids and this handles getting the asteroids. <laughs> This is the DART spacecraft. The DART mission is just a spacecraft that is going to go and smack an asteroid. It is fantastic to see it in real life. DART will only be changing the period of the orbit of Dimorphos by a, a tiny amount, and really that's all that's needed in the event that an asteroid is discovered well ahead of time before it might impact Earth. You can't have a mission like DART without finding the asteroids first. That involves searching for near-Earth asteroids, getting them in the catalog, calculating their orbits, tracking them, keeping an eye on them. You know, as a kid, I loved astronomy, I loved Star Trek, and so I became a research astronomer. My first observing run ever was observing the impact of Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 with Jupiter. I never would have known that somehow my career would kind of come full circle to be part of something that affects people's everyday lives. I feel really honored and humbled to be working in the field of planetary defense because it can affect people. It's just really exciting to have that kind of role in an area of science that has such a, a broader impact, you know, figuratively and literally. <laughs> In case there was an asteroid coming towards Earth and you're there, you can actually stop it. I mean, that's kind of fantastic. I'm Lena Adams and I led the team that built the spacecraft to go and crash into an asteroid. Behind me, you see the spacecraft. Once the solar arrays are deployed, it's going to be the size of a school bus. As the solar array opens out, it's going to swing out in this direction. DART is the mission to go and hit an asteroid and see if we can change its trajectory just a little bit. But in space, just a little bit is just enough to make an asteroid actually miss us if an asteroid was actually coming towards us. To me, the most important thing and the most exciting thing is all the technical challenges. My job is primarily to make sure all the systems on the spacecraft work together. On top, you see the next sea thruster. Over here is our star tracker. And then over here is our high gain antenna. My job is to make sure we hit. My job is to make sure we launch. My job is to make sure we're able to receive data back. There's Draco on the bottom of the spacecraft, as well, of course, is integration and test. As a mother of three boys now, we spend lots of Saturdays watching the spacecraft actually being integrated. They watch solar arrays deploy for the first time, just because we were all on Zoom at all hours of the day and night. I do Taekwondo. I'm working on my black belt, and hopefully I will get it right around the same time as the 
uh, launch of Dart. So it's also been a very long journey for me. Taekwondo kind of teaches you a lot of respect and a lot of patience for things you just need to keep doing it and make it better and better. And it's the same with space missions. Go Dart! Woo! The dinosaurs are made completely extinct by an asteroid impact so many years ago. Here we are, we can actually do something about it. I think this is just wonderful. Never in my life would I have thought I would take a couple hundred million dollar spacecraft and crash it into an asteroid. <laughs> my name is Michelle Chen and I lead the team that is responsible for the autonomous navigation of DART spacecraft to hit an asteroid. The DART mission is the first planetary defense test mission. Our goal is to hit and impact an asteroid to understand and study the momentum transfer so that we could potentially later down the road, if we need to, deflect an asteroid on its way to Earth. I am the SmartNav lead. SmartNav stands for Small Body Maneuvering Autonomous Real-Time Navigation. SmartNav, I always consider it sort of like the brains. And so the camera, Draco, is essentially the eyes. The algorithm has to identify and hit the target in the field of view of the camera. We're flying at over six kilometers a second. It essentially occupies a pixel up until possibly 30 minutes prior to impact. And then that's where everything gets really exciting. And so you could just imagine if it was a human being joysticking this. Because we don't know for sure what the asteroids look like, our simulation gives us the capability to use different asteroid shapes and asteroid objects to see that our smart nav algorithm performs against all these unknowns. We're super excited and nervous as well. I love pushing the boundaries and I love the application of math into real world problems, you know, and then seeing it actually doing its thing. To me, there's nothing cooler than that. I've always liked asteroids. There's so much we don't know about them that it's really exciting to me that we're finding out about the ways they've developed, the way they move, the way their orbits change. I'm Andy Rifkin, and I study how the orbits of asteroids change after we hit them with spacecraft. NASA is crashing a spacecraft into an asteroid. The DART mission is NASA's first test of a planetary defense technique called Kinetic Impactor, and it's going to smash itself into the moonlit Dimorphos, which orbits the asteroid Didymos, in order to change Dimorphos' orbit and show that we can deflect incoming asteroids if we need to. I lead a group of astronomers that are going to measure how much DART changed Dimorphos' orbit using ground-based telescopes all over the world. This is an animation. You can see Didymos and Dimorphos as one point of light. These curves show the brightness change due to Dimorphos moving in front of and behind Didymos. We can tell how quickly Dimorphos is moving around Didymos. We make these measurements before DART arrives, and then this is the same technique that we'll use after the impact to determine how much we've changed the orbit by. I make music. A lot of it, as you might imagine, has nothing to do with science, but a lot of it does. You know, I'm, I'm not, uh, not immune to, to the charms of writing, uh, writing a gimmicky science song every once in a while. So um, I did write a song about Dart. The mission goes by the name of Dart. <laughs> that double asteroid redirection test. And just one flick should do the trick. A lot of scientists definitely have a creative side. A lot of us write, a lot of us are in bands, or there's a lot who paint, and I think having that creative part of your brain definitely helps in science, just as much as it does in art. Practice planetary defense with DART. <laughs>
And this is the Lowell Discovery Telescope. This is what a 4.3 meter telescope looks like. This is what we will be using to study Didymos and Dimorphos in the days and weeks after DART impact. The DART spacecraft will be hitting an asteroid called Dimorphos, so special because it's a binary asteroid, which means a satellite around a larger asteroid called Didymos, and DART will actually be hitting Dimorphos. And what we will be measuring is how much DART changes the orbit of Dimorphos around Didymos. So this is an important test for planetary defense mitigation strategies in case we ever have to do this for real. The Lowell Discovery Telescope is one of many telescopes around the world which will be used to study Didymos and Dimorphos. It's really a global coordinated effort. And what we're looking at here is a large 4.3 meter primary mirror that's in the middle of the telescope tube here. Up at the top is a secondary mirror. The secondary mirror up top there is what is focusing the light down onto the instruments and allows us to take images with the camera that's located down at the bottom. This is maybe one of my favorite hidden rooms at the telescope. We're like standing inside the telescope. Room. Underneath the telescope, 100 tons above your head. <laughs> Held up by this and this, which is cool. It's sort of, as you can see, the, the highest peak around here. Uh, just over 8,000 feet. I come up here for sunset. Oh you know, God. sun setting right there, it's just, it's perfect. For DART, we're gonna be collecting images of the night sky. And typically an observer would be here in front of one of these consoles controlling the instrument and taking images like these as they're coming in off the telescope. DART is really a sort of before and after experiment. We need to understand the system before the spacecraft intentionally impacts, and then we have to understand what the outcome of that impact event is. As we watch from the Earth, Dimorphos will pass in front of Didymos and behind Didymos. What we will be doing with those images is measuring the brightness of Didymos in those images and looking at how that brightness changes. And those dips in brightness allow us to measure when uh, these eclipses happen and measure the orbit period of Dimorphos. And so you have essentially a fixed star field here. All the white dots are stars of different brightness. And moving through this field is Didymos and Dimorphos, which again, we can't distinguish them as discrete points of light, but we have that small object moving through the field of view. So after impact, we will then be able to go back and start observing intensely, looking for those mutual events, you know, those eclipse events of Dimorphos passing in front of and behind Didymos. And on each one of these frames, we're measuring the brightness to assess whether or not it's undergoing one of these events where Dimorphos is passing in front of or behind, and using those to determine the orbit period of Dimorphos around Didymos. This is such a cool experiment, it's such a singular experiment. Using the ground-based telescopes like this one and others around the world to, to watch the system and see how it's affected by this impact event because that's really what's going to give us the answer to what did DART do at the time of impact. And that will be exciting to see how that evolves over the days and weeks following that impact. Well, you've probably heard of the Drake Equation. It's said to be the second most famous equation in all of science, after e equals mc squared, a formula that you probably use every other day. Well, what is the Drake Equation? It was cooked up by Frank Drake in 1961 at the first modern conference on SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. He needed an agenda for the meeting. That's what this thing was. And he wanted to put it in the terms of, well, how many societies are out there that are broadcasting signals that we could, we could pick up? I mean, how many societies are out there in the Milky Way galaxy that are producing detectable signals that are going through my body as I stand here, going through your body as you sit there and watch this, okay? And it's very simple. It's like computing the number of students at Stanford University. You might not know, but if you knew how many freshmen were entering every year, you could multiply that by the length of time they stay there, typically four years, because most Stanford students are pretty good and they don't flunk out. All right, so that's what the Drake equation uses as its logic. So what it is is the first six terms are how many societies that have transmitting capabilities are produced every year in the galaxy. And then we just multiply that by the length of time that they keep the transmitter turned on. That's it. So what, is the, what are those first six terms? Well. The first term, R star, that's just the number of stars that are produced every year in the galaxy on average. They have to be the kind of stars that could have planets with, you know, with life on them, but then that's probably 99% of all stars. Okay, but then you multiply that 
by the fraction of those stars that have planets. Then you multiply by n sub b, and that's the average number of kind of Earth-like planets per average solar system. Okay, what fraction of those f sub l develop life? What fraction of those develop intelligent life? What fraction of those with intelligent life develop communicating civilizations? In other words, you know, they're not just sitting around there chewing their cud and reading cheap novels. They actually build transmitters and receivers and stuff like that. Multiply those first six terms to get together and you get the number of new civilizations produced every year on average in the galaxy that have the ability to transmit. And then the last term, L, is the number of years that they stay on the air. All right. So that gives you, you know, how many societies are out there. And if that number were very small, you would say, well, maybe SETI isn't such a good experiment because we're never going to find anything. If that number is very high, then you can say, well, maybe SETI's a really good experiment because we're going to find something fairly quick. All right. Well, <laughs> nobody knows what most of these terms are. I mean, we know some of the astronomy terms, but we don't know things like what fraction of planets that are kind of like the Earth, you know, eventually produce life, let alone intelligent life. Or how long does a a technologically sophisticated society stay on the air. Maybe they invent radio and then, you know, a hundred years later, they invent the bomb and they blow themselves away. I mean, we don't know, but it's a great way to organize how we think about these things. And that's why you'll find the Drake equation in the last chapter of almost every astronomy textbook you can buy. Communications we search for mean only that we're looking for some transmission, release of energy, which is clearly a result of technology, and therefore the result of intelligent beings of some kind. It exists on only a very narrow band of frequencies. It's generally polarized very strongly in one form or another. And usually it has some modulation, some variation in its signal, which carries the information for which the signal is uh, used. Narrow bandwidth, modulation, polarization. Those are our key tests. One of our challenges in SETI is that signals can come in a wide variety of forms. We use a limited uh, form of, of coding our signals. Uh, but there are other ways of coding which would make them so that we would not recognize that they were actually signals. They might look like noise to us. And uh, we would not realize that we had actually detected an intelligent signal. This is a problem. Uh, there are ways to solve it. They require extensive computer capability, broad bandwidth reception systems. Or if you're really going to do a good job, you need to watch all the time so that you don't miss any of the transients. And you have to look all over the sky because you don't know which place is most promising. And you have to look at as many frequencies as possible because uh, you can't guess what channel is the favorite of the extraterrestrials. This has always been vexing, particularly to the governmental fund providers. They know that there is a great public interest in detecting extraterrestrial intelligent life. At the same time, they know that we cannot guarantee that we will detect it or nor how much will need to be spent to find it. And so it is very hard for them to commit large amounts of funding when they can't guarantee that some benefit will accrue from that. One of the great recent advances in SETI is to look for not only radio signals, but optical signals. Signals from very powerful lasers, which we have now constructed examples of here in our civilization. We have constructed lasers which when they're light power is focused by a large reflector like a 10 meter telescope as we have make signals that are easily detectable from distances of thousands of light years and it could well be that the one of the ways civilizations communicate with one another is by powerful lasers and so we should look for them and we are doing that in the 57 years that uh, SETI has been pursued the greatest advance has been in our ability to look at many, many radio frequencies at once. 
We do have larger telescopes. My first search used a 25 meter telescope. Now we have a 100 meter telescope. That's 16 times larger. So our energy collecting areas are 16 times more. But what is really the big advance is that we've gone from being able to examine one or two or 10 radio channels at once to hundreds of millions today in the Breakthrough Listen project. I am not at all concerned about the possible bad impact of a detection of SETI. I think we will, of course, get something that maybe we can decode and interpret, and maybe we can't. But if we de start decoding it and find out it's something that is, in a way, bad for us, we'll just turn off the receivers and go, go home. I am an optimist about SETI. I believe that the large distance between the stars creates, in a way, a quarantine, making it so that it is actually not reasonable for one civilization to exploit or attack or damage another one. The great cost of doing that is far greater than any benefit that could accrue from it. So I do not feel that we are threatened by the existence of other civilizations and that we can only learn from them and they will not damage us. So to my mind, the name of the game is just to use whatever strategy allows you to look at the most stars at once and never mind which ones they are. Look where most stars are in the beam. And I have a prediction. Are you running? <laughs> the prediction is when we finally find a civilization, it will, its signals will be coming from a star that's not in anybody's catalog. to uh, close with. Uh, one of the early ones showed the mitigation uh, strategies. Uh, this uh, one on Tuesday is a kinetic impact, but of course the other one is a, a nuclear explosion. So we'll close with um, a time lapse showing every nuclear explosion that uh, humans have let off on the planet, except for the last two in North Korea. They, uh, they occurred after this was made. And uh, the background music is a taxi by Holtz from the planets. And uh, you may know that, uh, not by that name, but uh, by other names.
2,055 of them. Mm. So, it's astonishing, isn't it? I read it was 2,000 just a while back in the book, and I thought, is that number right? 2,000? That's a big number. It is a big number, and they're just the ones they've let off, not all the ones that are sitting, uh, sit, sit, sitting ready to go. Some of those, a lot of those would be underground, wouldn't they? Yeah. The other ones yeah. would all be underground. Yeah, yeah correct. I read once that, that they used to, uh, people used to sit on balconies in uh, Las Vegas and watch them, the only ones that were in, in, in the open, yeah. watch them going off because it was, it was so close to Las Vegas it wasn't funny. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> the insanity of that is just beyond belief. Yeah, a, a, absolutely, absolutely. The Russians were setting them off in the upper atmosphere. They were, yeah, and they set off the largest one as well. Yeah, yeah. the big one. And they were building one even bigger, and the Americans, the American scientists pointed out, they said, nitrogen in the atmosphere is going to burn at the temperature of this bomb, and it could just incinerate the whole world if we are not careful, you know. So they never ever set that bomb off. Just as well. Mm. <laughs> I put a DVD on that, it was quite interesting. Interesting, yeah. yeah. So it would be interesting how quickly they could mobilise it if uh, an asteroid was coming towards us that uh, a kinetic impact it was just too small to do anything about and uh, whether or not they could put it on something because of course they're, they're not uh, attached to uh, rockets that can uh, go uh, interplanetary, they're only ones that, uh, that can really go up to very low Earth orbit and arc their way around the world so uh, we've got a long way to go technology wise to uh, deflect these things and destroy them. And with that, I'll close the meeting and we'll see you at uh, October's meeting. Um, those of you who are coming on Saturday, do please let uh, Nerida know so we don't uh, buy too much food. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.